Hey guys, and welcome back. We are taking a look at the Rogue deck for Pauper that is known as Soldiers. Now, this is a deck that was popular about a month or so ago in place of some of the, the mono-white aggro decks that we had seen. Now, we had taken a look in the first video and seen what the deck was, how it worked, and then played through a couple example games because we were hoping to find room for the use of Attended Knight, which was printed recently in M13. So, before I had done those test games, I had a couple of thoughts in mind as to what might be able to go. The first thing that crossed my mind was this double use between the Armorsmith and the Armorer. Now, these two cards both have a similar ability in the fact that they allow your creatures to get plus zero, plus one. I thought maybe you could remove one of these two creatures from the deck in order to replace it with the Knight, and that would give you an opportunity to make the deck a little more aggressive because of the fact that your Knight is a 2-2 first striker. It's a bit more of a powerful creature. The next thing that crossed my mind was perhaps the Law Keeper. The Law Keeper is good, and it was definitely something that I saw as the best option for controlling an opponent's creatures. Now this is true, but I found a lot of times that I wanted it actually to attack instead of sitting there with mana open. You know, there would be times where I had one mana available, and instead of leaving it open for the Law Keeper, I almost wanted to rather play a Javelinier or a Death Deathblade Elite. So there were times where it just didn't seem as powerful. The next thing that crossed my mind was these token generators. It seems to me like a, a logical thing to replace a token generator for a token, regener token generator. So raise the alarm is great. We said it is the best spell that is available to us for generating soldier tokens. This is true. You get a one, two one one white soldier token creatures for the cost of two, which is very mana efficient. Now, my thought was that this could be replaced by the att Attended Knight because of the fact that the Knight also generates a token. Now, the Knight does come in at an additional mana cost, but for that additional mana, your initial token, um, which would be the Knight, is actually a 2-2 first striker. So that would be a little bit better than just simply two one ones. At the same time, having this singleton of Sen's Enlistment really didn't work out. It was rare that I drew it, and when I did, I didn't always have the mana for it. Now, moving on from there, after the, playing those test games, I do have a worry that kind of fits in at this point in time, and that was this 20 land mana base. Now, 20 land seems like more than enough for a deck with such a low mana, car mana curve, sorry. And this is true because of the fact that your biggest play is going to be on 3, not including the Sun's Enlistment. Um, on turn three, you want to be able to get either a Swordsmith, you want to be able to cycle the Gem Palm Avenger, or you want to be able to get Fortify going. Now this is great, but a lot of the games I found that I would get stuck at three mana, it was rare that I went beyond, and actually if I went beyond three to four or five mana, I was flooded and, and doing really, really bad. So Sen's Enlistment was something that it just seems like a, a great idea, but didn't quite work out as well in theory. Now, that being said, if I did decide to remove some of the raise the alarms, I think you would have to leave that in as an option for additional token generation. Now, like I said, we had three options for the three converted mana costs, the three drop of the game. That would be Fortify, the Gem Palm Avenger, and the Swordsmith. Now, adding in the use of the Knight is going to increase your mana curve, and that can be a little bit troublesome. So I definitely, after playing, am thinking that I don't want to add any more than three. I think any more than three is going to be too mana intensive, and we would also have to up the count of our lands to maybe at least 21. Um, there are times, like I said, where you do get the, the land flood, but more times you were stuck at about three mana, I found. So I think I am going to only add three. Now that being said, that makes things a little bit more tricky. I can't necessarily eliminate a full stack of one of these cards. If I eliminate a full stack of armors and then bring in three knights, that leaves me with 59 cards. We're good at math here, and that's not good. Which means we would have to find some other way to increase things. Maybe add a fourth fortify or something like that, but that at the same time is going to do the same thing that we were avoiding by only bringing in three knights bring in a fourth copy of Fortify increases our mana curve, and that means that we're going to be sitting at that extra high spot. Now, um, I think what I want to do is I'm going to, to kind of take the, the chicken way out of this, and that's going to be to remove a couple singletons, and instead of completely eliminating, here, we're going to bring our three knights into play here, 
And instead of completely eliminating a single card from the deck, what I want to do is reduce the count of some of the cards that I thought maybe weren't as powerful. Now, there were three that I kind of just talked about to you right there. The Lawkeeper, the Raise the Alarm, and the Armor. And we're going to kind of lump the Sen's Enlistment into Raise the Alarm. Now, I definitely think the Lawkeeper has to be cut down to three. It just, you know, it. there were so many times where I would much rather do other things with that mana, and I, I can see the situations where it would be absolutely useful. If I come against a Crusher, that would be just key to keeping that shut down. It gives us some options against Infect and stuff like that. But getting these weenie creatures out should be enough to at least stall for time and provide some blockers against Infect in that early game. Now, I also am going to cut back Veteran Armor. Now, if you compare the Armorsmith versus the Armor, the Armorsmith does cost two white, so in a multicolored deck, the Armor would be the better card, simply for the fact that it would be easier for us to find the mana cost. It's a little bit harder to find two white mana sources in a multicolored deck, but because we're only playing white, this isn't going to be an issue. Now, you eliminate that factor, you have to look at the rest of the creatures. Now, the abilities for these are slightly different. The armor is any other creature other than the armor gets 0-1, and the armor smith requires those creatures to be soldiers. Now, usually this would be a drawback, but because our deck is running only soldiers, it's going to be not so bad. Um, the knight, I know you're all saying the knight is not a soldier, so that could hinder us a bit, but most of the time you're going to be able to do this. At the same time, you have to take into consideration the fact that the Armorsmith is a 2-3, as opposed to the Armorer being a 2-2. In order for the Armorer to get that 2-3 ability, you need to have a second Armorer in play. So, definitely a little bit tricky here because of the, that fact. Um, I think the, the deciding factor is this ability where it says the Soldier Creatures. Um, Getting this extra defense on the knight would definitely be important, so I am going to cut the armor smiths down to three. Um, next up is is really this debate that I, I am still kind of going through as I am doing this commentary between Sen's Enlistment and Raise the Alarm. Sen's Enlistment is great. I love the retrace ability, I love Flame Jab, I love Raven's Crime. I love the fact that you can discard lands to replay a spell from your graveyard. I have always been unhappy when I find myself in land flood. I'm okay with being land short. That doesn't bother me so much, but if I get an, ex an excess of land, then I I'm not a happy camper. So having something like Sen's Enlistment to be able to get rid of extra land and give me something beneficial for it is definitely something that I find appealing. That being said, it is, it is tough to find that foreign mana because a lot of the times... I mean, Sen's Enlistment, what it is, is a mid to late game card. That's where you want to have it. Now, you know, in the early game, it's not going to be so good because you may not find yourself at four mana, or you're going to have something that you would rather play. You would rather cycle a Gem Palm Avenger or play a Fortify, something like that. So it's definitely a late game card. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing either because this deck doesn't have a lot for the late game. This is your typical aggro deck where the idea is to win as fast as possible and getting that in late is not necessarily going to be something that you can do. Um, a lot of times you, you end up in this kind of make or break. E either you go in fast and you win the game, or you just kind of stall out. You get to the mid to late game and your opponent is finally drawn what he needs to keep you under control. So, I think what I'm going to end up doing is cutting Raise the Alarm back to 3. Now, I might regret this, and... Uh, I am going to, to live com these, these games again to test and see how the knight works out in the deck. I'm a little bit nervous because of the fact that it is not a soldier creature, but that 1-1 one, one token could be just enough. I mean, it's got the first strike. Um, it can still get you know a, a beneficial ability from the fortify. But we're going to see how this goes. Um, and it may be, you know, I may find at the end of this, I'll, I'll kind of recap at the end of the third game my thoughts on whether or not I made the right decisions. Um, and, and we'll see basically whether or not I think Sen's Enlistment should have stayed or gone. So, going to take a, a quick cut here and go to the games. Alright guys, we're sitting down to the first game here. Yes, I would like to go first. 
Alright, opening hand, we have two lands. We have one drops available to us and two drops, so we're going to definitely keep this. I think I'm going to start out with the uh, Def, ba Def Blade Elite. I don't know why I keep stumbling over that one. Uh, this will give us a chance to get this guy going early as possible. Um, once we start getting these uh, armors into play, it's going to be a great opportunity to kind of force him to block into it. And then uh, that'll leave the way for, for other creatures to get through, and I can also keep him alive because of that extra toughness. Opponent is playing a little slow. I did uh, switch the game times on these, so hopefully they go a little bit better. I know these games are going to tend to drag this video out, but it's what you guys wanted. So, not a third land drop is a little disappointing, but it's still kind of early. We're going to put down the armor first because of the fact that we do have those creatures, um, those new knights that we added are not soldiers, so we want to be able to get those with a bit of a, a toughness increase as soon as they come into play. Alright, green-white. I'm not sure what we are playing against. Oh, green-white tokens. This could be painful. Um, luckily, we did get our third land here. That means that we can put down the swordsmith which means that when I provoke the Deathblade Elite, we'll be able to force the Evangel, Evangel to block, um, and that means that it will die, and I don't have to worry about that token generation getting out of hand just quite yet. Um, usually these start with... Um, start with, you know, uh, uh, one of the sisters, so they can gain some life. You can't see it right now, but my opponent is not blocking get that illegal blocking note in chat spamming over and over again. Oh well. Um, so that's great. Getting that, that swordsmith into play on turn 3 is definitely critical. That works really, really well because now it makes the, the elite that much better. And this is another reason why putting that into play on turn 1 was so much better than the javelineers, because of the fact that we could get this going fast. Um, you know, I talked about kind of a defensive play over on the veteran armor, but it works just as well when you look at the armor smith. Um, if not better, because of the fact that my opponent is running these kind of small creatures, and I'm going to be able to provoke every turn. Uh, you know, putting out this land or else, he has to know that it's going to be forced to block that Deathblade Elite. Um, this is probably going to get a concede here. Yeah, um, that's unfortunate that he didn't want to play it through, but playing the, the green-white weenie deck um, token generation is definitely in a, a bad spot for my opponent when he has to face down this Death Blade Elite on the first turn, and more importantly, when I got this uh, Swordsmith, um, that just makes it that much better. And you know, this this provoke ability is definitely underestimated, and it works very well for this deck. And definitely going to be a critical thing to keep in mind um, if you take this deck for a spin yourself. So, going to pause this right here so we can save as much time as possible, and I will resume it when I get another game. All right, second game here are going to play first. Looks like the dice are with us today. Opening hand, two lands available. We have a turn one play, which we can in turn use to get that Skyfisher in on turn two. We're going to keep it. Um, so what I'm probably going to do here, I'm going to start out obviously with the Law Keeper. Now this gives me a chance to turn two, get out a Skyfisher, and not set myself back a land. That's not going to be so bad. I think if we... Okay, we do get another land. Um, had we not gotten a land getting the, uh, you know, on turn three, getting the Skyfisher into play would allow us to return a land and kind of get an additional mana. But because that did work out in our favor, we are going to return the Law Keeper, keep ourselves ahead of the game. Just in case we don't draw any more land at this point in time, it will give us opportunities to use Gem Palm Avenger in these turn, um, these early turn options. So, gonna put out the Javelinier and the Law Keeper. I'm gonna hold back this other Skyfisher until a point in time where I use this token off the Javelinier. I'm not happy about seeing this, uh, first off, because it is not quite one of the decks that I was hoping to face is gonna be a, a rogue homebrew. Um, and this was the other reason, because this always equates to uh, Edge of Divinity, instantly turning it to a 4-4 lifelink. Um, it would have been great had he not had that, because I would have been able to pick it off with the Javelinier. Unfortunately, um, usually when... I, I have never seen anyone miss this. I don't know if they just hold on to it until they can do both of them at the same time. But it always comes out this way. So I am going to take four. My opponent's going to go up four life. But we're going to be able to keep this guy tapped out because of the Lawkeeper. 
and thankfully we drew into another land there. So, we're going to attack through. I'm going to play a little defensive here. I'm going to leave my Javelinier back so I can use that counter ability. I'm going to leave the, the one mana available for this. And I'm going to actually just pass the turn. I could have cycled there, but giving the, the plus one, plus one ability to simply the Skyfisher, not something I really wanted to do. Uh, Tendrils is coming down. What I'm going to do is tap this out. And I'm actually going to use the Javelinier to kill my own creature to prevent the life gain. Let's see. Okay, we're going to attack first. Then I'm going to put the Skyfisher into play and bounce the Javelinier so that I can get it back and reuse that token, that counter. And then I'm going to put down the Armorsmith. This will give me a chance that I can block and kill this, uh, this guy if he does not have a kill spell, which I'm guessing he does. Um, looks like he's playing this as mono black, uh, despite the fact that these do require... Well, they, they are optional for white, I will say that. Definitely going to be a bit of trouble if he does kill it off. Uh, mostly the trouble here is going to be this lifelink ability. Here we will do both of these, give him the option what he wants to kill off. Um, the life gain, I think, is the more troublesome thing here, not quite the, the fact that it is a 4 power creature. I'm usually very easy going when it comes to taking self damage, um, letting creatures through. But that being said, I want to be able to at the same time be doing damage to my opponent. Alright, yeah, he's definitely playing a mono black here. Alright, so we're going to put the Javelinier back into play. I think we are going to cycle this time, just for the fact that I think we need to draw a card. Alright, and get another Avenger. Interesting. And see what my opponent comes up with. He is getting to quite a lot of mana, so he's going to put something nasty into play soon, I imagine. Corrupt? Ah, uh, corrupt. Good old corrupt. So this is going to be definitely tricky. Uh, I'm going to attack through. I am going to cycle once again. Like I said, the life gain is actually going to be the most difficult thing for me to deal with here. Now we get that planes. That means on the next turn I can use actually both Fortify and the Gem Palm. Um, but I feel like I'm going to hit another Corrupt. And I am. Jeez. Alright. That's just a uh, great draw for my opponent. I'll give him that. I'll attack through. The first thing I'm going to do, what you want to do if you're in this kind of situation where you have the mana available to use both Gem Palm and Fortify, start with the Gem Palm just to see what you draw into. At this point in time, the Gem Palm plus the Fortify is not going to finish off my opponent. Alright, six. I am at eight damage currently, plus another six. It is only going to bring me, um, oh god, live math, up to 14. So it is not going to finish off my opponent. So I'm going to take a chance and hope that he does not have the winning kill. If he has another corrupt, it's game over. But I'm going to take the chance. I mean, I can't win the game anyway, so no point in putting out the fortify. Does he have it? No, crypt rats. Oh, that is even worse. That is game over right there. Okay, crypt rats is one of the, the things you definitely don't want to see. Uh, this is actually a modified mono black control, so I'm okay with this, um, even though it was a bit homebrew. Now, Crypt Rats is the one thing that is definitely going to really, really hurt your deck. It is the best answer to aggro there is out there. Um, especially if you don't get a lot of those. You see, at that point in time, we had a lot of creatures with that low toughness. Most importantly, he had enough mana available to do damage to kill me off. So whether or not it killed my creatures, it was going to be game over. Um, Crypt Rats is the best answer that an opponent can have to you. There are th things out there like Shrivel, Nausea, which will do a lot of harm to you, but if you get those Armor or the Armor Smith into play, you will be able to keep them kind of without of that range. Echoing Decay, a little less powerful to, fa to, to deal with. Um, it can't take down your Skyfishers, which are going to be great. And again, if you get a couple of the Armor Smiths into play, you're going to be able to at least beef up that toughness. It only hits a select creature, so it's only going to take down a select creature type. And then the final thing you have to watch for is going to be Rolling Thunder. 
and that will be definitely troublesome if your opponent decides to use it as creature wipe. Most of the time they're going to hold it for the win because of the fact that that will be their only win condition and it will be singleton, but watch out for it as a full wipe. Um, sometimes, you know, it's just a good lesson. I guess you don't always want to throw out all your creatures at the same time. All right, going to pause this real quick and grab another game. All right, game number three here. I'm actually a little concerned. I'm hoping that we see an attuned knight in this game, um, something I had not considered. Okay, opening hand, we've got a, all one drops and three mana. We're definitely going to keep it just from the fact that we have lands available to us. Um, and we're going to start out again with the Deathblade Elite because we don't know what my opponent is playing. Most of the time, that's going to be your first card. Unless you have, like, Skyfisher, then Javelinier will be a much better choice because of the fact that you can get that early damage, you can get it back into play and regain the counter. So, Probe coming out. That tells me that he's either playing Storm or Delver. There are a few other. I mean, I guess Infect does occasionally run it for a bit of card draw, but until he plays a land, I just don't know. Alright, Island comes down. It's definitely going to be Delver Blue. Now... This could be a decent matchup because of the fact that we have things like the Javelinaire, which I will definitely put out next turn. It will be great for dealing with things like Delver before it flips and controlling down fairies. At the same time, the Provoke ability will be great. Great to have that already in play. Obviously a little bit mana flooded here, but that's okay. We're going to be able to get these creatures in before my opponent gets the ability to counterspell. He could have dazed at one point in time, but that's going to set him back a land. Um, and not all Delver lists run that, actually. So, could be a decent matchup. We do have a lot of things that they're going to want to counter, and a lot of stuff that they may be unsure of. Kind of one of the, the benefits you can get from playing a homebrew deck. Oh, oh ho ho. I was completely wrong. Um, I was going to say one of the benefits of running homebrew is the fact that you can... Um, uh, I can't finish my thought. I've been so thrown off by the fact that this isn't Delver. Um, running a, a a homebrew rogue deck, your opponent may not be familiar with your list. He may not know what to counter, what to control. Um, so this is actually the Wee Fiend Aggro. Uh, what I am going to do is attack with these guys. I am going to provoke the block and use the Javelinier to finish it. Um, this is going to cost me the Death Blade. Keeping In this matchup, it's very important to keep under control the Kiln Fiends and the Weed Dragon Knots. Um, if they can get one to attack and get damage through, you could be in a bad spot. Oh, that's not good. Um, because I imagine that he... I mean, he saw the Javelinier. He knew it was coming. He probably has a second one that's going to come down at this point in time. Um... Because usually if you're you're playing this matchup against control as the Wee Fiend player, you just you're pretty smart about how to play certain cards. Sorry about the dog barking in the background. Um, and you can get around it, but oddly enough he doesn't. I really would have thought that because of the Javelinier and the Provoke ability, he would have realized that it was going to die. Let's see what he has going on. The shadow ability there was just to draw cards. Um, he's going to slowly pick off these little creatures, but that's okay. Any spell he's using to control my 1-1 one, one creatures is a spell that he doesn't have later on when he does get one of those Kiln Fiends or the Wee Dragonauts in play, so it will not be making them any bigger. Now, Kiln Fiend I'm not so worried about. We do have creatures with two attack that can block. Um, it does get more tricky because of this shadow rift. Definitely, definitely tricky. Definitely tricky. Um, there's also the double strike ability. Oh, what is coming down? Gush. Okay. Which he can do because he didn't make his land drop. So he's going to have mana available. He's really digging for, at this point in time, using Gush and stuff like that, you're digging for, yep, the Dragon Aunt, um, or a Kiln Fiend. Now, this is a, a very bad position to be in because we do not have the death blade we cannot provoke um, and get the win off that luckily we do have these law keepers we can use those to actually keep our opponent tapped down occasionally these uh these decks in the past have not had any kind of option for preventing you doing things to their creatures um, Recently, they've had the addition of the Apostle's Blessing. Someone realized, hey, this is stupid, why aren't we running these? So they do run those with no white mana in order to be able to prevent you from targeting their creatures. 
Uh, hopefully, he, our opponent here is not running those, or at least does not have those. Um, if we can keep this Dragonaut tapped down, we should be decent. Um, going to definitely put down the second Law Keeper, just in case he does have... I mean, they do run things like the Electrostatic Bolt, as we saw. He also will be able to run things like Lightning Bolt and take down creatures. So if we can get two of those and keep those in play, um, we're also going to take an opportunity to cycle the Gem Palm here so I can draw a card. Having that, that extra guy in place means that it gives me another opportunity to keep that Dragonaut tapped out. Um, I like to do it early on in his turn before he draws a card. If he um, draws into, you know, the Apostle's Blessing on the draw phase, then that kind of... that's gonna hurt. I mean, if usually the, these decks can set themselves up pretty well uh, if he he's gonna lightning bolt the law keeper, yeah, um, they can set themselves off pretty well where they can be in a position. If you let them attack once, they can probably win the game. Um, my opponent may not be able to at this point in time because he doesn't have a second mountain. Having one red mana available means he's only going to be able to do. Well, I guess we'll see what he's got. Um, the double strike ability is definitely a, a big winner. If he just casts that, you're looking at a four three. Uh, mutagenic growth. It's a it's a really cool deck, but if you're playing any kind of control variant, you can dominate it pretty easily. Unfortunately, we are playing aggro. So, this might actually be game. Like I said, if they find the opportunity to attack through, they can usually take you down. He needs the double strike ability to really be able to do it here, but if he has more of the shadow rifts, he can draw into it if he does not currently have it in hand. Let's see what he's got. He's currently at 9. There it is. The salt strobe comes down which means that he is going to be able to beat us out. This is, man, this is uh, mildly frustrating, but like I said, if you let them get through once, they can win the game. And because we're not running control, our best option for keeping these is the Law Keepers. We did actually manage, surprisingly enough, to get three of our three Law Keepers into play, which gave us a great opportunity to, to put ourselves in a position to win this. But the fact that you're running so many Lightning Bolts and Electrostatic Shocks means that there's nothing we can do. It becomes a race. You see, we got him down to four life. Just needed to be a little bit faster. So that's definitely unfortunate. Um, I'm going to take a quick pause right here, jump over to the deck editor, and we're going to give a quick summary. So, final thoughts. Um, a little disappointed. We just did our three games, and we did not come into the attended night a single time. Um, that's that's a little awkward, I, I guess, is, is the best way to put it, because the whole point of this was to see if this card could, in itself, make this deck what it is. Um, make it to be a thing. Um, I guess if I had to come to a conclusion, the conclusion would be that no, Attended Knight is not going to make this deck into a viable thing. I think this deck has power and could be a viable thing on its own without the knight. Um, I don't think the addition of the knight will make or break this deck. Uh, actually, I, you know what, I'm going to continue to sit and play a couple of games until I actually get an attended knight, and we'll see how that goes, and I'll add it to the article there, but for the video purposes, we're done at this point in time, um, and I guess the final result, like I said, is the fact that this deck could be, you know, a viable aggro strategy if you're looking for an aggro deck. Um, if you're you don't like the knight, don't add it. It's not going to hurt you. It's it's actually not going to help you that much either. So there you go. Kind of an odd conclusion, but hey, that's kind of half the fun is is coming to these interesting conclusions together. And yet, it's still a little awkward. Oh well. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. Uh, next week we have um, hopefully hopefully if you check out my article series next week we are going to have our comprehensive look at the competitive pauper in general. Um, it's been a lot of work. I've been putting a lot of time into it. Uh, maybe I'm just slow. But anyways, it's going to be done hopefully, hopefully, hopefully next week. Check it out. Um, and uh, I will catch you all later.